Hi, I'm Ken Fisher. Welcome to the 19th season of Citywide. My guest on this edition of Citywide is New York State Senator Gustavo Rivera. Welcome to Citywide. It's a pleasure to be here. You have been in the State Senate since 2011. Yes. So some of our viewers who are not from the Bronx may not be familiar with uh, the area that you represent. Mm -hmm. So it's nine different neighborhoods? After it's, 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 com it's a complicated, I call it kind of an unruly district. This is what nonpartisan uh, this is what partisan redistricting gets you. Uh, it goes as far north as 238th and Broadway, as far south as 168th and Webster, and as far east as Van Ness, Morris Park, and a little bit of Park Chester. Uh, it includes the zoo, and all the animals in there are Democrats except the elephants. You can't, can't count on that. Fordham University. Uh, Fordham University is right outside of it, but I have uh, the neighborhoods of Kingsbridge Heights, University Heights, Fordham, uh, East Tremont, Belmont, Van Nest, Morris Park, and a little sliver of Parkchester. So it's quite a, a quite a, a big district. So demographically, primarily Latino, young, old, rich, poor, a little bit of everything. Uh, well, I represent about three hundred eighteen thousand people, um, and it uh, the the median income of them is about twenty five thousand dollars a year. So we're talking about working class men and women, uh, and you have uh, mostly of them are Latino, uh, over sixty percent, and there's a very good. Uh, combination of Dominicans, Puerto Ricans, a growing section, uh, a growing sector of Mexican uh, population, uh, as well as central, other Central American countries, uh, Honduras uh, and uh, Costa Rica, etc. Uh, and I also have uh, a, an older African American population that's also, that's also in there and a small, uh, very small uh, Caucasian population. So mostly it's Latino, but certainly people of color, all working class people, mostly living in rent stabilized apartments. I live in one unit myself and I've been uh, living in a rent-stabilized unit for most of the time that I've been in New York City and up in the Bronx. Uh, so it is, it is a very diverse district, uh, and, uh, I, and I love it. Now, you yourself are not from the Bronx originally. Where, no, sir. Where, did you, where were you born? Where did you grow up? Well, I was born and raised in Puerto Rico. I came here in 1998 uh, to do a Ph.D. in political science, actually here at the, the CUNY Graduate Center. You'll notice, however, that if there is a little name underneath my face right now, it does not say Ph.D. next to it, so that tells you how far I got. I started doing, uh, working in government and campaigns uh, since uh, 2000, so I kind of uh, put my studies on hold. I might eventually go back, as my father says, you know, hopefully you'll get no one day. That's, you know, hopefully that'll happen. But for the most Every part, I've family been, wants a doctor. <laughs> yes, yes. And uh, so I, I came here originally to do that, but I started working in government and politics. And I've uh, I found that public service is certainly where I want to remain, although I'm still teaching college. I taught college. Uh, since 1999. Did three years at Hunter College and have taught part-time at Pace University for most of that time since then. Uh, and uh, will continue to do it. I love being in front of a classroom. One of the political positions you had was with uh, the Service International, SEIU, Service International uh, uh, Union. Service Employees International Union, yes. Right. So I'm struck by how many current public officials, elected officials in New York, have been with SEIU or uh, their affiliate 1199 mm -hmm. at one point in their career, starting with Bill de Blasio, who yes. was a consultant with them. I think the Speaker of the Council, Melissa Marcus. She used to be Toledo. an employee for them, yes. Uh, Darlene Mealy, council member from Brooklyn. No, Darlene Mealy used to, used to be a, uh, she used to work with TWU a Local A different union, right. Division. But, there, but there, are, there are other SEIU unions mm -hmm. that, are, that are involved. Is that, is that healthy for, for democracy, for, for unions to be electing so many of their members to public office? Well, first, I was, I was, I'm still a member, actually, of NYSIT, uh, okay. because I'm a political science, a part-time professor, so I'm still a member of NYSIT. And I worked with uh, SEIU, leading some of their political teams, uh, canvassing teams and such, certainly during the 2008 campaign for Obama. Uh, and going all the way back to, you mentioned Melissa Mark Viverito, 
Uh, I, uh, in 2005, when she became a city council member, I actually ran that race for the last couple of months. And we did it along with a, a, a very uh, a lot of, of members from 1199. Now, as far as it being healthy or unhealthy, the, the fact of the matter is that I have a large sector of the people that live in my district are working men and women that belong to unions. Whether it's the Transit Workers Union, the teachers, or to, uh, UFT, uh, 1199 as healthcare workers, 32BJ, CWA, Communication Workers of America, et cetera, et cetera. I have thousands of men and women that are part of my district, that live every day in my district, and are able to thrive in the city of New York in the 21st century because they are part of, uh, of organized labor. So what are the issues that are most important to them today? So the three that, it depends on the day, one of them might jump up, uh, but the three that unmistakably, uh, economic development and job creation. Usually uh, when somebody recognizes me on the street, usually the first question they ask me is whether I have a job for them. Um, housing, whether it's maintaining the affordable housing stock that we have right now or the development of new housing units that are affordable and the definition of what exactly affordable is. It's, you know, in, in when, a, when you have a district that $25,000 a year is a median income, it's kind of hard to define exactly what affordable means. And third, public safety. Uh, there have been certain, uh, when there's spikes of, uh, of shootings or, or, or violent acts, uh, sometimes they happen in the neighborhoods that I represent. So if, it's, if there has been a, a shooting or a violent incident, then public safety jumps to the top of the agenda. If somebody, like they always, uh, one of my things, one of the things that people come into my office for the most is to discuss issues of housing, whether they're getting uh, potentially kicked out of their apartment. When that happens, that is the number one issue. But those three things, economic development and job creation, housing and public safety are kind of interchangeable on a day-to-day -day basis. Is the Bronx better than it was when you came to New York in 1998? I certainly think so. I, I moved in, I moved to New York uh, in 1998, as I said, but I moved up to the Bronx in 2000. 2000. Uh, and uh, the neighborhood that I, that I live in, I live in 195th and University, where I'm just a block from the Kingsbridge Armory, which maybe we'll speak about because there was a lot of great things that are going to be happening in that building in the next couple of years. Uh, the, the neighborhood has, has definitely changed, and I believe for the better. I have Lehman College just a couple of blocks from my house. Uh, Bronx Community College is a little bit further south, but is also part of my district. And I've seen the changes that have happened uh, in, in the people that live in my neighborhood and certainly some of the, uh, some of the buildings that are there, the, the cleanliness, et cetera. And I know that, that uh, we have had, as far as crime, even though we have a, some spikes here and there, for the most part, we, we live in safer neighborhoods in the, in, in the Bronx. So I believe that it has gotten better. I think one of the things that the, the disconnects um, in the city is that when people outside of the Bronx talk about when is the Bronx going to happen in the way that Brooklyn happened over the last 10 years, some people are predicting that it's Queens will be the next 10 years. Um, when, when people talk about when is the Bronx going to happen, it seems to me that there's a, a assumption in it that what the Bronx needs is gentrification. And yet, it sounds like in the neighborhoods that you represent, new apartment buildings, new residents, even if they brought with them uh, jobs, service jobs and restaurants and entrepreneurial opportunities, but that that's not what your constituents need. I would say that the challenge is always, development is always going to happen. The challenge is that, it is that it happens in an inclusive manner. And to speak about the Kingsbridge Armory for yeah, a second, since it's, I think it's, it's a perfect example of the challenges that we're going to be facing in the next couple of years. For your, for your, uh, for your viewers, uh, very short, the Kingsbridge Armory is, is the largest armory in the continental United States. It's a city property that sat unused for over a decade. And just recently, uh, the Kingsbridge National Ice Center, so NIC, uh, NIC Partners for short, uh, proposed to build the largest ice sports facility in the world in this building. Now, this is nine professional sized rinks uh, to be used on a year round basis. Now, let me be clear. I'm, I'm from Puerto Rico, as I said. Yeah, for I was me, wondering. For me, ice is something you put in a rum drink. It is not, I've never skated in my life, and even though this building is, will, be, will be a block from my house, I don't intend to because I'm too old to learn now. But the important part about this is that the organization that is bringing that, the developers that are bringing that there, are doing it with private money, but they came to the community and in good faith negotiated a community benefits agreement, which will include living wage jobs for the people there, every job more than, every job more than living wage, local hiring, 50,000 square feet of community space, et cetera, et cetera. The challenges are going to be what happens in the businesses that are immediately out, outside of it, as well as the buildings, uh, as well as the apartments that are immediately around it. 
we're already seeing how some people are trying to take advantage of the situation. We're very much aware, the local elected officials, the community board, the merchants association. We want to make sure that the changes are going to come. We want to make sure that they are inclusive of the people that are in these communities. So uh, the community benefits agreement in this particular instance is an important aspect of that. But as we continue to see changes in different parts of, 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 my, of my district, another thing that's happening in Cortona Park is that a huge modern tennis center is being built. Uh, and we're going to have that. Uh, a lot of people are beginning coming into the Bronx to play tennis in a in beautiful uh, courts. Some of them are going to be, uh, you know, having a ceiling above it, et cetera. So this is going to bring a lot more people into the Bronx. We have to make sure that as this happens, the people that have stayed in the Bronx, that have fought to make sure that, that these changes happen, are included in these changes. So th I think there's also a perception that while corruption has been, unfortunately, uh, stubbornly present in all five boroughs of the city, that the Bronx has had more than its fair share. And fairly or unfairly, um, I get the sense sometimes from the development community that they're held back by that perception that, you know, they think that any time they go to the Bronx, people are going to have their hands out. Sometimes it's going to be legitimately for jobs for the community. Um, uh, and then other times it's just going to be having their hands out. So is the corruption in the Bronx endemic? Is it still a problem? Uh, your own district uh, mm -hmm. has some history of that, not Absolutely. you. Um, what do you think? Well, I think to, to, to talk about my district for one second and the reason why I take this job as a public servant extremely seriously, my three predecessors, Ken, have all been in prison. Three? Three. The last one, Pedro Espada, is still in prison today. His predecessor, Efren Gonzalez, also was in prison a few years for violating the public trust, and his predecessor, Israel Ruiz, also went to jail for a short period of time. So the last three senators that represented my district have all gone to prison. Um, I've gotten both elected, re-elected, and now elected for a third term. Once I serve out these two years, I will be the, the longest serving non-indicted senator in my district. Uh, and for me, that is, that's a low bar. I want to make sure that I raise the bar much higher above that. We need to make sure that the work that we do as elected officials, because it's so easy to attack us, because there's been many, there have been many people who have done horrible, stupid things, and certainly some in my backyard, it is particularly important, the work that I do every day as a public servant, to make sure that I hold values that were taught to me by my family, uh, make sure that, the, uh, that the, what I do every day that my acts are the ones that define who I am. I can say whatever I want. I can say that I'm clean and what have you. I believe that the last four years I've demonstrated that and I will continue to do so. So to, to, to relate to development, um, the process that we went, I returned to the Kingsbridge Armory because it's important. What was negotiated there in the Community Benefits Agreement was negotiated by the developer with a, com with a group uh, of community members that represents all sorts of different aspects of the community, whether it's merchants, uh, fa communities of faith, tenants associations, community groups, etc., that got together on a ta around a table and said, we are going to, if you're going to bring this here, let it be something that's going to benefit us as well. There were no hands out. There was a negotiation in good faith to make sure that the final product would benefit the community that's there. And I believe that that's the type of thing that we need to do to make sure that we can bring good development up to the Bronx. Citywide will continue right after this. Welcome back to Citywide. We're speaking with New York State Senator Gustavo Rivera. You are currently the ranking member of, the senior member, I guess, mm -hmm. um, of the Health Committee in the New York State uh, Senate. Um, what are the issues that you're thinking about most these days? Well, I should say first that my first two years in the Senate, I was the ranking member in the Crime Victims, Crimes and Corrections Committee. And it's one, <clears throat> it's a committee that I'm still a part of, uh, and it's something that's in incredibly important to me. But health, um, let's talk about health for a second. The Bronx, out of 62 counties in the state of New York, unfortunately, is the unhealthiest county. The Robert Woods Johnson Foundation, for three years in a row, has found that the Bronx has you know, high rates of obesity, diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, et cetera, et cetera, you name it. Based on that, uh, a couple of years ago, once my colleague Tom Duane retired from the Senate, I was part of the, com of, of the, of the Health Committee, but I, I asked my leader to appoint me as the ranking member. And hopefully, if we are able to do the things that we need to do politically in this season, um, we'll be in the majority, and it is likely that I will be the chair of the Health Committee. Uh, and it is an incredibly important issue, not only uh, because of the day-to-day -day lives of Bronxites and New Yorkers, but just 
reality as, as far as the budget is concerned. The budget this year was $143 billion. And New, York 60, budget, New York State budget. New York State budget, $143 billion. $143 billion. Of that, $66 billion was Medicaid, which is health insurance for, for poor New Yorkers. And $4.5 billion of it was public health money on, that's not tied to Medicaid. So almost half the total state budget on a year-to-year -year basis is related to health. Uh, and there's never been a person of color or a Bronxite that has had the position as the health chair. So I'm, it's a responsibility that I take very seriously. And as far as what are the things that we need to do, on trend, um, the continuing implementation of Obamacare is incredibly important since we need to make sure that more people have health care. Has it made a difference in your district? Absolutely. It absolutely has. We have uh, various uh, clinics. As a matter of fact, I remember a few, year, a few months ago when it was being uh, last year, <clears throat> When it was first being implemented, we had, uh, we had some navigators, which are uh, individuals that were, uh, whose job it was to learn to know about Ob uh, Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, so that they could then tell people how to apply and all that stuff. And I remember having a, a group of about 80 to 100 people that were wondering whether it was going to potentially make a, li a difference in their lives. And I, I remember that we had the navigator was right across the street. And as they asked very specific questions about particular details, I'm like, I don't know the answer to that, but you know who does? Right across the street. And we kind of repeated it as a mantra. People kept, kept going there for weeks, like just repeating that, like, you're right across the street. And having, having their answers given to them, ultimately, you, what you're doing is you're providing more health care to people that did not have access to it, thousands of people. There are still aspects of it that we need to work out, and particularly as it relates to Medicaid, something else in the state of New York, is that we need, we're transferring, uh, we're doing something that's called Medicaid redesign. Over the last couple of years since Governor Cuomo came into office, there's been a transformation of how exactly Medicaid is organized, and now it's no longer eating up uh, our budget in the way that it was in years past. And we need to continue that while we manage some of the difficulties it's also, in it. It's also resulting in um, a shift away from hospitals mm -hmm. towards uh, more sophisticated ambulatory kinds of, of, of setting. That's had some consequences, I would assume, in your district That's, also. It, it has, and I, think, and I think this is a conversation that we need to have and we need to be as honest about it as possible. The fact is that in certain instances, hospitals are not going to be the best way and most, most cost-effective way or most, or most effective way, period, to deliver care. Uh, we're going to have to ask tough questions of how we deliver, of he about health care delivery in challenging communities. Uh, the district that I represent, I have two uh, big hospitals in it, Bronx, Lebanon, and St. Barnabas, and then Montefiore Medical Center, as well as North Central Bronx, are just a bit north of my district. And these are all key institutions in my district that provide care to very challenged communities. Uh, and, they're, and they're faced with some of the challenges that we're having right now on this transformation of the Medicaid system, as well as the influx of all new people that have health care that didn't before. Uh, and this is, this is, these are changes that we're going to continue to have to deal with in the next couple of years. The core of it is how do we continue to deliver quality care to communities that need it? Uh, and the type of institution that provides that care, that's going to be the challenge. So you alluded to uh, the fact that we're in a political season. Oh, yes. Um, as we uh, prepare to broadcast uh, uh, this uh, uh, session, we are weeks away from the general election. The Democrats are making a major thrust to try and become the majority party. Uh, the Republicans are parrying as best as, as, po as they can. And at least according to this morning's political uh, blogs, uh, the polls are not looking as good for some of the uh, uh, races uh, where Democrats are challenging Republican incumbents or where you have marginal uh, Democrats outside of the city. So what's your assessment of where things are and where they're going to wind up the day after election? These are always going to be challenging times. There's three Democrats, namely Terry Gibson, Ted O'Brien, and C.C. Katchik, that are in the upstate, uh, upstate of New York, in the Hudson Valley, in the Capital Region. Uh, and, and these are not easy seats to keep. But I believe that over the last couple of years, we've seen, uh, even with redistricting, that the, the, the Republicans drawing their own district lines, adding districts where uh, they had population loss, and creating districts where, where that are overwhelmingly white when most of the population growth has happened both downstate and amongst people of color, they tried everything that they can to stop the demographic shift that is coming. That's number one. They're not going to be able to stop it. Uh, but they are challenging districts because the Republicans drew them to be challenging. Now, what is going to happen? 
A couple of years ago, the Democrats took over, and I say them, I was not there. Uh, even though there was a core group of people that wanted to govern, the fact is that there were a lot of folks that weren't. Uh, some of them are in jail now, including my predecessor. They were not there to govern. Uh, we had a lot of people that, uh, of good, you know, good character that weren't really ready to deal with the responsibilities of governing. That is not the case anymore. We have a different democratic conference and we are ready to govern. We understand that that's the most important thing. We have to tell New Yorkers, we can govern. We're not going to, you know, upend the state. We're not going to destroy the state. This is not going to be the same mess. It's not going to be the New York Post putting pictures of senators with clown noses in their cover like they did a few years ago. I believe that with our leader, Andrew Stewart Cousins, who has demonstrated over the last couple of years that not only her intelligence, but her class and just the quality of person that she is, she has led us to the point where we can potentially take over. And a couple of months ago, as I'm sure that your viewers and yourself know, some political deals were struck, some alliances were forged. The idea is that the reason why these alliances were forged by some folks that I should mention had never been at our back before. They're now there because they understand that we can lead that we can govern and that we are close enough numerically to be able to do so. So let's let's drill down on that a little bit yes. because um, one of the people who will definitely be in the mix is your colleague from the Bronx, Jeff Klein. Yes. He and some other, a small group of Democratic state senators declined to caucus with uh, the Democratic Congress. Oh, I see what you did there, decline. Oh, very good pun, Ken, uh, very good pun. And uh, And now they are um, have opened the door to that through negotiations with the Working Families Party, with the governor, with the mayor. Um, they may make the difference as to whether or not the Democratic Conference has a majority. So the process seems a little bit unseemly from the outside looking in. Um, what do you think the outcome is going to be? And are you okay with the wheeling dealing and the political deals that you alluded to? Well, the main shift is going to be the last two years, uh, and for, for your viewers, four years ago, uh, five Democratic senators left the Democratic Conference and founded, four, I'm sorry, four left the Democratic Conference and formed the Independent Democratic Conference, IDC. Two years ago, we had enough members of the, of the conference, uh, of, the, of the Senate, I should say, that had D's next to their name, so for us to be in the majority. However, they joined with the Republicans and had a Republican-led coalition. Through many, many things that have happened over the last couple of years, but certainly the main one, that there's an understanding that we can govern, that we are not the group of people that was there before. There have been some, some agreement, a general agreement, that what we're going to have next year is a Democratic-led coalition. Now, this is not going to be simple. It is, uh, there's a lot of, you know, people that have, that, that have had some issues with what Jeff has done over the last couple Bad of years. Bad feelings all around. Certainly, but we're, but we're all grown-ups and we understand that it is more important to put those bad feelings aside. And Jeff and me have had some clashes over the years, but I respect that he, is, that he has recognized that being together as a, maybe not in the same room, but certainly in the same coalition, would be better for New Yorkers. We could actually govern in a, in a positive way, and that's what we're going to potentially do next year. There's a lot of things that can happen between now and January, but I, I don't have any reason to doubt that they will keep their word, that they will caucus with us. And again, there might be some difficult times, but I think that it is that these are positive steps to go towards having a, a, a democratic-led coalition and a government that actually responds to the needs of New Yorkers better than the one that we've had in the last couple of years with a Republican-led majority. So in how this is going to play out in practice, obviously personality politics will, will play a big role, but it also strikes me that the city of New York as a, as a, as a whole, the city council and the mayor uh, together, um, have a more cohesive, progressive view of the world. Your colleague in the city council, uh, Richard Torres, majority leader um, of the council working with the speaker and the mayor, um, want to push the city to the left on issues like minimum wage and, and uh, uh, income inequality and the, uh, uh, and the like. It's more complicated for Democrats in the state Senate, isn't it? Because if you, if you go in the same direction, you have uh, the possibility of getting ahead of um, what your colleagues in those marginal districts will, will be able to do. Um, and otherwise, you put them at risk for two years from now. So, do you, do you think that the statewide perspective is going to uh, put some limits on what 
a Democratic conference will want to do um, when it comes to issues that may be of concern to the business community and the like? I'm not going to lie about the fact that I am certainly an out-of-the-closet progressive and a liberal. I don't think that's a dirty word. And that means that I have liberal values and, and I believe that those values uh, will lead to policies that will make lives better, life better for the people that I represent in my district. But I recognize that when we, if we are to be in the majority, and I believe that we will, we have to govern for the entire state. It is the reason why someone like C.C. Katchik, uh, who is Cecilia Katchik, who is a representative up in, up in uh, Hudson Valley in the, the capital region. She is a farmer. She lives in a farm. I don't think I've ever stepped foot in a farm. Having her as my colleague means that I get to better understand the issues of rural New Yorkers that I don't understand. And I recognize and I think that the whole entire conference, and certainly our leader understands that. We have to govern for the entire state. Ted O'Brien from Rochester, Terry Gibson, potentially Justin Wagner in the Hudson Valley, and potentially one or two new members from Long Island. Having these people come into our conference means that we get to learn about what happens in suburban and rural districts and be better able to make policy for the entire state. And all of us that are, again, grown-ups and believe in governing, I know that I'm never going to be able to get everything that I want, just in life, but certainly in governing. You have to understand that when you come to the table, you say, this, this is what I propose. You come with something different, and we negotiate to come up with something real that we can get, that, that can actually be implemented. That's what we're going to be doing, be doing. and certainly going to respond to the, to the interest of the entire state, not just of my constituency. I'm going to fight for my constituency each and every single day, but I understand those senators from upstate and rural districts are doing the same. And if we get in the same room together, as we will, hopefully, as a majority, we'll be able to talk and govern for the entire state. My thanks to New York State Senator Gustavo Rivera, an elected official for all of us to watch. I'm Ken Fisher. Thank you for joining us on this edition of Citywide. Send your comments and suggestions to Citywide at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or contact us at CUNY.TV.